live in this city, and I don't actually come across very many deniers um, in my world, which I should be very lucky for, but I come across a whole lot of people who don't do anything. Dissidents. Yeah, and the, and the thing that I'm asking as I come out of Miami and then looking at all these slides and these presentations is, what is our call to action? What are we asking people to do? What do you ask people to do at the end of this when you say, okay, we've proven that this is a problem, I've got you on board emotionally, now what? Like, I've been asking myself this for a week, now what? Okay, so. I mean, aside from sign up for Clean Power SF or what, you know, like whatever my little thing is, there's, there's something more than that. So right? of course, that's the big question that we're all struggling with. And one way that I approach it is I ask, who is we? And I come up with four major categories, a lot of categories, but four major categories. The person that says that to you. Individual, community, business, or government. So first thing you think of is, okay, what is your category? Are you an individual? Then do things that individuals can do. But things that bring you joy and beauty and accomplishment and control, like voting or changing your life goals or whatever it is, even if it's a small thing, lots of small things help. Something that you can do and that you want to do. If it's a community, um, citizens climate lobby, or the green building councils, or the AIA, or um, community libraries and sustainable lap yet, you know, groups that come together, what can you do that brings you pleasure, joy, and control? Start with that. Don't start with what can you do to bring down greenhouse gas effects. It's too distant. Um, for businesses, a lot of what we're doing is we're talking to business leaders and asking them, what are you doing? What is your material science? Uh, what are you making? What are your modeling? And what can you do within your own company that might contribute it? And get a personal effect on that. And government, same type of thing. Okay, and that might help you focus in on their individual needs. Marie? Could you please put that one slide frame to my question? My concern is that we live in a society that's so here and now oriented that the pleasure, joy, and the belonging of now and control and achievement of how they feel now is a completely complete disconnect from what's in the future. Mm -hmm. And until people understand that this is that all of this is threatened now and there's a reason to think ahead to the future, and I'm not sure our society is, mm -hmm. is well, our society is incompetent in that way. Um, Mad Men helped us create that, right? <laughs> we have a generation where we're, we're addressing here and now to satisfy our pleasure, pleasure, joy, belonging, control, and achievement. We don't look ahead to the future. That's a paradigm switch. That I'd love to help you give me some tools to address because um, that's the bigger problem. I mean, no one can conceive with the San Leandro Marina development, for example, and the EIR, that there's going to be a need for them to, to make allowances and provisions for the Bay Rise because everything's planned as the conditions are going to take place today as they are today. That's this tiny example in light of our little world, um, but that's magnified millions of times. So it might help to expand the, the bubble of what their joy and pleasure are. So maybe their joy and pleasure is, um, I like to leave the shower going for 20 minutes. <coughs> That's the immediate joy and pleasure. Everybody loves that. But if you expand it and say, I like to prevent the drought, bear with the examples. But yeah. if you expand it, it's still the same concept as the overall. We just need to get them to start thinking in a long range fashion. I'm but address the same path. I'm pleased to see the change and spiritual communities. Mm -hmm. I lived in Modesto for 25 years, yeah. and I can speak to what the evangelical community would say to that. It doesn't matter. I've heard that. Mm -hmm. Because then when you're in that religious sense, it doesn't matter. It tries to come to church groups. So um, those, are, those are difficult things that I haven't yet been able to, mm -hmm. to um, Even with the Pope? <laughs> yeah. Start from top down. Yeah, keep going. Yeah. Okay. Got a few more minutes. Um, go ahead. I um, worked off Center Run. Project where I, it's, uh, I did an art project called 50 Ways to Tame Our Wicked Climate Crisis. And um, speak to food. I, uh, <laughs> I worked on a project all summer called 50 Ways to Tame Our uh, Wicked Climate Crisis, an art project. And so I researched solutions all summer and came up with 50, 50 ways. And it was, it was really inspiring because there are so many people all over the world. I mean, literally all over the world working on amazing, amazing yeah. things. And they're touching people's hearts. Yeah, and really touching people's hearts. Yeah, great. Yeah. Thank you. Steve. 
So the, the first time that we brought a climate presenter out to Lafayette, the, the big question I had was, what's the, I'm a marketing guy, I was like, what's the title, what's the theme, what's the angle? <laughs> and the guy, I think it was from the peninsula, said it's the climate reality presentation. And I just said, huh, because I was thinking I need to market this to the community. And so my question for you is, what have we learned, what, what has everybody learned about, you know, how to find an angle or a theme that's gonna sort of capture the imagination of, of, of a business or community or a church or whatever. Mm -hmm. So for me, as a salesperson, I, the first thing I ask is, um, there's a lot of first things I ask. I ask them all at the same time. But who am I talking to? Who my audience is? So if it's a group of business people, then I have to talk business language to them. And if that's <coughs> economics, it's economics. If it's profit, it's profit, whatever it is. But I need to talk about that. If it's school age children, if it's seniors, if it's retirement people, um, if it's deniers, focus on what are, their, what are they hearing? What are they buying? What's important to them? So there's no one answer. It depends on who you're talking to, where you are in the country, um, and that's why it's really powerful also to have, and Ken will talk about this, people that talk to their peers. Whether it's religious groups or science groups or whatever, they're talking to their peers, then because they are the ones that know what's important and fashion it to that. But you might ask if you have a climate speaker to your own event, say, they should ask you who's our audience and then try to tailor that to them. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, so I actually have a friend who's quite a skeptic, and I'll, and I'll say two things. First, one is it's actually helped me a lot to, to learn from it because it, it gives you the other perspective. So I think if we see that as an opportunity, it's a good thing. You know, they provide information. The other thing is that over the last week or so, I would say he's actually been converted. And, mm -hmm. Part of that was to go, part of that was really that if you recognize that there's a lot of articles out there, and we'll call them all data points, even if one of them shows 17 years and one shows 15 years. And, and so there, you know, the web is indiscriminate in terms of what's good and bad data. And, and I think people choose what they want to see. And ultimately what it, it took with this guy was basically to step back and say, you know, we can look at the glaciers and the things that have happened in our lifetimes, and these are visible, and people are not faking, you know, glaciers retreating. And so once you take it out of the data into something visible, um, to a, it sort of defeats those arguments that it's getting colder. <laughs> you know? And that was, that's exactly the point that made me start thinking about the difference between feelings and defense mechanisms. Because I've had many conversations with people during my talks one woman came up and said, you just gave a really political, political argument. And I looked at her and I said, tell me about your t-shirt, Veterans of Foreign Wars. And I immediately knew it was a defense mechanism, it was not a core feeling. What she's hearing is, the United States is contributing all these gases, so we're not good, so we're not great. But really what it was was a sense of pride. It was really pride. So if we could get through the denial by asking, is it just a defense mechanism? What's he, what's he scared about? And then address that. It might be a chart, but it might just be, she was scared because what I was insinuating is her life work was not valuable. And she was, she's angry, and she's, what's the opposite of pride, you know, insecure. And I'm attacking her. And she saw it as a personal attack. Get past the defense mechanism and to the core feeling. How do you do that? Um, I, With her. Here's, here's the other thing I learned about sales, is I don't need to answer, I don't need to solve it. I just need to let them voice it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's enough. Voice it. Let them be. Let them voice it. Are there any questions on the first part of the talk about um, getting presentations? Yes, sir. You know, I just had a resource to share. Um, I don't know if there's the Yale Project on Climate Change Communication. Mm -hmm. uh, has this really great report called Global Warming Six Americas. They've analyzed all different, so that's about a people at different stages or different kind of belief systems about, so the way they say, six unique audience segments that view and respond to the issue in dis dis distinct ways. They have a ton of research on there about, so it's, it's an actual research about how to, about how different people view climate change and how to address those specific different audiences. Where is it again? Please repeat that. <coughs> Yale Project on Climate Change Communication. Are there any questions about the how to get into um, presentations? Are we gonna? I will probably ask questions about that later. Okay. Just because it's a great list of <laughs>
Please, and everybody has a handout. <coughs> yeah, I just hear my handout. Pardon. So on control, um, there's an extraordinary pressure to give people a sense of control and the things they can do. But there is also the acknowledgement that this is not in anyone's personal control. And so I think there's a huge dissonance in trying to solve that. Um, and so I don't know what to say about that except the <coughs> caution that you know, we, we're shooting at a low-hanging fruit if we're just giving people personal control. It's about being involved in, in politics or in collective and being part of the story is not, it, it's just about control. That's a very important thing to do. But when we overemphasize, for example, your personal contribution, you know, it's, it's solving a control issue that, you know, at some level, learning to be comfortable not being in control is a thing to do. That can help too. So <laughs> that's just my point. But it's also about expectations. If you set your goal as winning a marathon, and then you, you can't do that, then that could be that could backfire. But if your goal is to compete, if you set your expectations at a reasonable level, then it could be inspiring. The goal is to inspire. Bruce? So just to add to that, one of the things that I used in my presentations was uh, giving people the power to um, not just stand by when you hear other people deny the claim. And that, that is really something that's in your control. And if you're comfortable with it, you just simply let people get away. Peter, I'd like to mention one more thing. Great talk, <coughs> words, but your last slide which says don't focus on the pain. Um, has anyone here read George Marshall's book, Don't Even Think of It, Why Our Brains Are Wired to Deny Climate Change? Yeah. The penultimate chapter in that book, if you get a hold of it, just read that, is his advice on how to talk about this issue. And one of his <coughs> points is to show empathy to the denial mechanism that people use so that they don't have to acknowledge their pain about <coughs> what they have already lost and what they will lose in the future. Because, you know, if the ship has left port, we're gonna lose a lot. And that's very painful. I bet you that's why a lot of us are here. And we experience that pain every day. And he recommends, especially with conservative audiences where you might get a lot of resistance, to specifically acknowledge how uncomfortable and painful it is to grasp the facts, take them in, and just deal with it, because this is the reality that we have created for ourselves, and it hurts to think of what we've done and what's going to happen, <coughs> that we cannot stop. What's the book again? George Marshall, Don't Even Think of It, Why Our Brains Are Wired to Deny Climate Change. So I found it to be a if anybody's moment. ever gone through counseling or therapy, one of the most <laughs> powerful things you can do is say, I hear you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Thank All you right. all.